Thank you very much, Tadeusz. Good evening or good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome from Jerusalem. Thank you for joining us. My name is Karen Sethill from the National Library of Israel, and it is a great pleasure to open this third event in our series, marking this special Platinum Jubilee year in Her Majesty's Kingdom, celebrating the rich history of anglo Jewry. Following on from last week's presentation on popular Yiddish culture and immigrant life in London's Yiddish town, this week we will focus on smaller Jewish immigrant communities and hear about some of the minority and probably less well-known Sephardi communities in the UK. We will also be moving from printed materials, as Vivi Lacks presented last week, to oral histories, a chance to literally hear the individual voices and their authentic stories. At the National Library of Israel, we are looking forward to uncovering our Sephardi archives and making them accessible thanks to our special partnerships with the Samis Foundation in Seattle. We are also increasingly recognizing oral history as an important and irreplaceable form of documentation of the diverse Jewish experiences from the 20th century, and those include Refuseniks, Ethiopian Jews, and life in the early years of the State of Israel. We're integrating thousands of videos linked to the Hebrew University's Oral History Division and connecting nicely to our guest speakers this evening. We're also working together with Global Sephardi Voices Network with whom we, we, with whom we have an agreement to absorb, preserve and make accessible their collections of interviews. We've started with 160 interviews from Iraq and, oops, and elsewhere. Sorry, my camera decided to turn off, but we hope these to grow and greatly expand in the coming years. So I have very great pleasure in introducing our speakers for this evening from Safadi Voices UK. Dr. B. Lefkowitz is a social anthropologist and oral historian and is the director of two oral history archives, AJR Refugee Voices, Testimony Archives of the so Association of Jewish Refugees and the Safadi Voices UK archive. Her research includes oral history, trauma and memory, diasporas and displacement, and nationalism and ethnicity. She has worked on many oral history projects and has directed and produced a wide range of testimony-based films. Amongst her publications are The Jewish Community of Salonika, History, Memory, Identity, and Emigre Voices, Conversations with Jewish Refugees from Germany and Austria. Thank you for joining us, Bea. Daisy Aboudi has been Deputy Director of Safadi Voices UK since 2017. Over the course of her career, she has carried out close to 100 oral history interviews. Her interests include questions of identity, heritage, and education. In addition to her work at Safadi Voices UK, Daisy runs Tales of Jewish Sudan. Her work has been featured on the BBC Associated Press, Al Arabiya English, World Jewish Congress, and in several Jewish publications. Thank you for joining us and I'm hand over. And as today I said, please put your questions in the chat and we'll try and get to as many as we can at the end of our presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, I'd like to thank the National Archives of Israel for inviting us today and to talk about the work of Safadi Voices UK and sharing some of the histories we gathered uh, from our interviewees. I should say from the outset that the Sephardi Voices UK archive was set up to document the histories of the Sephardi Mizrahi Jews who came to the UK post-1948, many as refugees. Our aim was not to address the settlement of the Spanish Portuguese Sephardi Jews who settled in the UK in the 17th century when Oliver Cromwell became Lord Protector of England. The Spanish Portuguese Jews, the early, the, the early in the early immigration, founded the first synagogue in 1657 followed by the opening of the beautiful Bevis Marx Synagogue in the city of London in 1701. And Bevis Marx is the oldest synagogue in the UK with continuous use until today. Sephardi Voices UK from its outset was interested in the more recent migration of Jews from the Middle East, North Africa and Iran who had come to the UK in the 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s. We use the word Sephardi, Sephardi, originally referring to Jews from the Iberian Peninsula in the broader way to include Mizrahi Jews referring, Jews, referring to Jews from the East or Oriental Jews. And the term Mizrahi Jews is not widely used in the UK. 
In our presentation today, my colleague Daisy Aboudi and I would like to tell you first about Sephardi Voices UK and about what we do, give you a short overview of the historical framework of the emigration um, and the displacement process experienced by our interviewees, and then discuss aspects of acculturation and identity. We also prepared two short films for you today, so you can hear the interviewees in their own words and get a feeling for the oral histories we have collected. So let me just briefly say something about the history of Sephardi Voices UK. I co-founded Sephardi Voices UK in 2010, following the completion of another oral history project, which was mentioned before, the AGR Refugee Testimony Archive, which deals with Jewish refugees escaping from Nazi Europe, who came mostly before the outbreak of World War II to the UK. The historical context of the Sephardi uh, post-World War II emigration is broader and embedded in the wider history of colonialism, the end of empires, the emergence of Arab nationalism, and the creation of the State of Israel. When we started the project, we felt very much that the history we're dealing with was forgotten or marginalized, not very known in wider British or British Jewish society. The British historian, Sir Martin Gilbert, who just published then in 2010, the book in Ishmael's house, underlined this point when I interviewed him. He was very pleased that the project such as ours was being created. And here you can see on the slide what he said to me. I'll just read it. The Jews from Arab lands have become parts of many different nations and culture. Here in Britain in particular, their stories are not very well known. They have their own communities. The more the British Jews can understand that this is an integral part of the British Jewish story, um, the better. This story needs not only to be told, but needs to be recorded and needs to be available because the next generations of historians, writers, novelists, journalists need to have the ability to get the stories and see what the Jews from Arab lands have lived through, what they've achieved and what they had suffered and what became of them. And I, I can only hope that the next generation of writers, journalists, historians will really use uh, the interviews we have collected. I'm very happy um, that 10 years later, through our work and the work of organizations like Kharif in the UK and Germena, next slide please, Daisy, and Germena and Sephardi Voices International in the US, the situation has slightly improved. One challenge in, in the UK is the number of Sephardi Mizrahi Jews is quite small, as the UK was not a major country of Sephardi Mizrahi immigration. And we can see some numbers here. Next slide, please. Figures, figures for this migration are actually hard to estimate. We know that the number of Sephardi Mizrahi Jews make up roughly 6% of the Jewish population in Britain today, which is about 15,000 Jews. Following the rise of nationalist movements, anti-Jewish leg legislation and expulsion post-1948, post, post for example, from Egypt in 1956, Jews left their home countries in large numbers, as many of you will know. Um, of the 820, sometimes also 850,000, the numbers are not quite clear, let's say 820 to 850,000 Jewish refugees between 1948 and 1972, more than 200,000 found refuge in Europe and North America, while 586,000 were resettled in Israel. Many of the Sephardi Mizrahi Jews who came to the UK joined the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue or founded their own synagogues or stayed unaffiliated. And that's partly a challenge because for us, of course, it's much harder to find um, the Sephardi Mizrahi Jews who, who are unaffiliated. We have interviewed a few of them. From 2010 until today, we've interviewed 120 men and women and captured the memories of Jews who had to leave their homes in cities like Baghdad, Cairo, Alexandria, Basra, Khartoum, or Tehran. Next slide, please. All the interviews are accessible at the British Library and at the Anu Museum of the Jewish People in Tel Aviv. But many edited films and information about the interviewees um, is, are available on our website. To find out more, please visit our website, www.safadivoices.org.uk. What the interviewees have in common, that they had grown up in multilingual, multicultural, and multi-religious environments where Jews occupied liminal spaces living in the legacy of the Ottoman Empire and in societies governed by European colonial powers or newly emerged nation stage, states such as Iraq in 1932. Being exposed to European culture meant for many to be educated in French, Italian, 
um, or, or going to British schools and having access to French, Italian, or British citizenship. So in fact, the Jews in Algeria who were expelled uh, following Algeria's independence in 1962, they were expelled as not for being Jewish, but they were expelled because they were French citizens. Now, let me just say a few words about our methodology. Uh, next slide, please. Sephardi Voices is an oral history archive. It was conceptualized as a rigorous oral history archive, which will preserve the unique experiences, insights, and perspective of the men and women who narrate their lives, lived within the historical and cultural parameters of the time. And our focus is both on history and also on memory. And I was very pleased to hear that oral histories are now going to um, uh, play a bigger part uh, for, you, for your collection. The interviews last on average from one to four hours. The aim of the interviewer is to help the interviewee tell her or his story without too many interruptions. Our questions are aimed at guiding the interviewee, the interviewees, and to help the interviewees to narrate and reflect back on their lives. At the end of the interview, we also filmed photographs and documents. So in fact, Safadi Voices UK is not only video archive, but also an important photo archives because each interview uh, we film about 10 uh, or capture 10, 20, sometimes even more photos and documents. The enormous value of their stories, the stories we collect is threefold. First, the oral histories allow us to gather undocumented information of historical experiences. And many of the, the stories we hear are, are not so well documented. Second, they also allow us to understand how individuals make sense of their own experiences and how they interpret their own lives. And third, and that's a very important aspect for us as well, the oral histories are also given to the interviewees and their families, so they have a tangible narrative in form of a recorded video of the life of a mother, father, grandmother, grandfather, or another family member. So that's just a rough overview. And I'm now going to hand over to Daisy, who will tell you more about the demography of our archive and who will discuss some of the experiences of our refugees, um, of the refugees in the UK. Thank you, Bea. So uh, first of all, just a, a quick map on where we're actually talking about geographically where our interviewees come from. Um, and I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but just so that you've got a rough idea um, of, of kind of the geography. Um, so I want to start by talking about kind of where we've interviewed our, our interviewees um, and where, where they've lived in the UK. So the vast majority of our interviewees um, moved to England and within England, most moved to London um, with Brighton and Manchester coming behind that, Brighton and the South um, East region. Um, of that, most of those people who lived with outside of London have actually retired to London. So by the time we interview them, they're already living in London. Um, all of our interviewees have taken place in England. And that again, reflects the demographics of the Sephardi or Mizrahi community within the UK. So the demographics of our interviewees kind of reflect the makeup of the Sephardi Mizrahi community within the UK. Looking at these statistics that you can see, you can see that the majority of our interviewees were born in Egypt, 45. This is, um, we've, we've since interviewed um, three more people and they, they're all from Egypt as well. Um, there are historical reasons for this. So under the Ottoman Empire, Jews in Egypt had been defined by their religion rather than their nationality. But in, nine, in 1875, mixed tribunals were established and this meant that foreign nationals were subject to laws of the country whose citizenship they held. And by adopting foreign nationalities, Jews who could afford to do this could, afford, could enjoy the physical and financial protections of, of the mixed tribunals from, from European countries. Each country had a different criteria for obtaining nationality, but at least 25% of Jews in Egypt did manage to obtain a foreign passport. That was helpful in 1875, but in 1956, when the Suez crisis happened, uh, the Brit British and French nationals were expelled. Amongst them were thousands of Jews who were declared enemies of the state and given between two days and two weeks to leave the country. And all of those who held British citizenship arrived in England as refugees. So there is a larger community of, of Egyptian Jews here in England. Um, so you can see with this 45 Jews and 40 of those came to England 
um, in the 1950s from Egypt. The next largest community of Middle Eastern Jews in the UK are those from Iraq. And again, that's reflected in our um, interviews. Um, while some of Iraq's Jews left the country following the Farhud pogrom in 1941, the vast majority, over 100,000, left Iraq between 1950 and 1951. And those of those, most were uh, airlifted out of the country and flown to Israel. So of our 27 interviewees who were born in Iraq, 11 left in the 1950s. Those who remained were often wealthier members of the Jewish community who had a high economic stake in the country or those who had ideological convictions to stay. The majority of Jews who left Iraq after 1951 um, did so in the 1970s, usually illegally. They were smuggled across the border to Iran and arrived in Israel or Europe as refugees. And again, that's reflected in our interviewees because nine of our Iraqi born um, interviewees left Iraq in the 1970s. The demographics of our interviews also reflect colonial European colonial rule. So as Jews left their home countries due to dispossession, expulsion, or to escape worsening political climates, the countries they chose to go to reflect old colonial lines. So we have in the UK, a lot of Jews from Egypt, Iraq, Sudan, um, and Baghdadi community in India, which we also um, interview for Sephardi Voices UK. Um, whereas uh, those from Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, and Lebanon generally headed to France. And of course, I'm only talking about the people who could afford to choose where they went. Finally, our archive also reflects secondary migration patterns. So for example, a number of our interviewees first lived in Israel, arriving there as refugees, and then later chose to relocate to the UK as economic migrants. And um, a large number, of, not a large, but a significant number of our female interviewees moved to the UK after meeting husbands in the first country that they went to, whether that be France, Switzerland, or wherever else in the world. So, oh gosh, that's the wrong slide, okay. I'm just gonna stop my share for a second. Um, I'm, sorry. We changed the slide last minute and of course a slide is missing. Sorry, I understand you can cut this. Okay, um, so having arrived in the UK, whether by choice or necessity, all of our interviewees faced the challenge of integration into British society. For a few, this was an easy transition. Um, for most, it meant a steep learning curve and a period of adjustment. Um, so this was especially difficult for older adults and many of our interviewees talk about how their parents struggled um, and in some cases failed to fully integrate into British society and a lot of people talk especially about how their elderly fathers struggled to adapt um, when they've kind of lost their jobs and everything they've, they've known. Um, and accounts of how each person navigated this change kind of varies as much as our interviewees do and, and their personalities. Some managed, like Linda Dangor, who you can see on the screen, she, she managed by throwing herself headfirst into, in, into life in England. She left Iraq with her family aged 10, spent two years in Lebanon before moving to London. And she navigated this change at, at a critical age of you know 12 years old by completely shedding her Iraqi identity in England and she only came back to it as a young adult in her 20s um, in France, brought her back into her kind of taking ownership of her Iraqi identity, which I'm sure Bea will talk about more. Others found common interest groups. So Rebecca Hakim Dweck, who came to the UK from Lebanon as an adult after the Civil War, immediately sought out a bridge club that she'd played in Lebanon, um, and she knew she'd find like-minded community there. And others adopted new interests. Emmanuel Menachem, who you can see as well, 
Um, his photograph was actually the promotion for this uh, night's event. Um, and he arrived in the UK as a young boy following the Suez crisis. His family moved near to the Tottenham Hotspur football stadium. And it was through attending matches there every week that he learned English and also found himself a community and, and a sense of belonging. Others, um, in a minute, I'm going to show you a film. Um, you'll see these four, five people on the screen um, speaking. Um, and you're going to see a very short clip from each interview. All of these interviewees were born in Egypt. And although they arrived in the UK at different, they, and they all arrived in the UK at different times under different uh, circumstances. But through exploring their stories, I think we can learn a little bit about the common experiences of integration within our archive. Um, these experiences include adapting to life within an Ashkenazi majority, feelings of cultural alienation, the desire for acceptance, and the impact of these communities made on the UK itself. So you're first going to hear from Raymond Dweck. Um, he was interviewed with his sister Giselle and they arrived in England as refugees following the Suez crisis. Raymond was 14 at the time and the family, like many others, were taken to refugee camps in the British countryside. Um, a lot of the, um, our Egyptian interviewees who arrived in these camps were taken in by Ashkenazi Jews from the local communities and their experience on how uh, positive that was varies quite a lot. Um, but they do all speak about the culture shock they experienced when encountering these Ashkenazi communities. They couldn't understand the prayers, they didn't know the food, um, and in some cases um, it was around Pesach time they were living with these communities and they found it very hard to navigate the Seda. Susie Dweck, uh, not related to Raymond, held an Italian passport and left Egypt in 1958, so two years after the Suez crisis, and she left to study in university at, in Geneva. Whilst there, she met her future husband and the newlywed couple moved to Leicester in England together in 1961. Despite already having lived in Europe for two years, Susie found herself very culturally alienated in Leicester. She had a young baby, um, she had to learn how to navigate centralised NHS systems, um, and she's not the only one of our interviewees to talk about the um, shock that she experienced at the lack of produce um, in the UK at the time, you know, rationing had kind of just finished in 1961. Um, and she also compares the vibrancy of and the colour of her life before and juxtaposes this with the kind of drab greyness of England, and this is kind of quite a common um, kind of trope within our interviews. The next one down um, that you'll hear from is Dame Margaret Hodge. She is a, one of a very small number of our interviewees who, despite being born in Egypt, came from an Ashkenazi background. Her parents had independently moved to Egypt from Germany. And by the time Margaret was born in 1944, the family were amongst the larger community of um, Egyptian Jews who were stateless. They left Egypt in 1949 um, and they arrived to the UK as refugees. Margaret was first elected to parliament in 1994 and received an MBE in 1978 and an OBE in 2015. And for her family especially, this kind of signified a sense of security. Um, they, Margaret Hodge was interviewed with her friend Sonia Cantelow and her sister Hannah Edmund. And finally, you're gonna hear from Ellis Dweck. He was born in 1934 and came to England in 1952 to study to attend school. He went on to study medicine in France and became a renowned ear, nose and throat surgeon. In his interview, Ellis speaks a lot about the na changing nature of society in England. And I've just put in a small clip of that kind of long conversation that they had with him. And like many others, he notes, he notes that the UK has become more multicultural now since, in, since the 1950s. Um, other interviewees have expressed the same opinions, but many of them actually go further than Ellis, um, talking about the racism that they experienced when they first arrived in the UK, which wasn't um, Ellis's experience. So now I'm going to just show you that film.
We arrived in England in January of 57. We were escorted, believe it or not, by St. John's Ambulance, a charity that took us from, from, uh, from Victoria Station to Euston and, put, and escorted us to a, a disused army camp in Warrington between Liverpool and Manchester where we were, we were housed. This is where you remember what it's like to be a Jew because both communities of Liverpool and Manchester came to find us to see how they could help. Mm -hmm. And they, the Liverpudlian Jewish community, offered us a disused cheder. They said, fine, since you're all going to be resettled, in the meantime, we as Jews will step in and you can have the use of this disused, no longer required cheder. So from, from being in a refugee camp in the middle of nowhere, suddenly we were allowed to live in Liverpool and to begin to, 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 to make connections with the Liverpudlian Jewish community. Well, uh, it was drab. I grew to love Leicester, you know, and I regretted when I left it and I still got friends and things from Leicester, but it was so drab. You know, at the time, there was only one shop that sold garlic. There was no aubergines, there was a, you know, all you could see was onions, carrots, potatoes, cabbage. You know, that was the thing. And yogurt, you only find it at the deluxe uh, uh, grocer shop. I've been in politics a very long time and he was still alive when I got my first recognition from Islington. Britain when I became I got a, an MBE so mm. it must have been 19 oh no it's 1978 so he was still alive and I remember ringing him up to tell him before it was actually um, publicized and he I mean he just couldn't you know it was so important to him mm. it was a zillion times more important to him than it was to me Although I felt quite proud mm. because it showed that we had been accepted, accepted. Mm. and that was so important. Because I was British, so I didn't have to be natural, like, yeah. you know. So, uh, uh, but my father had been also a very precise man. And he told me, when you get to England, go and regularize your situation. And he said, because the British Empire is coming to an end. And there are millions of people like us who have British nationality and have never been to Britain. And the British will say there is no room, which is in fact what they did. I feel more at home in England now. Uh, then certainly I did when I came. But this is not because I changed and became more British, but because Britain became more foreign. So that's just a very small um, flavour of our of our interviews, and you'll see it, see a bit more later. But I hope that kind of gives you an idea of just how vast and, and the breadth of how um, you know people felt coming here. Um, so as Bayer said, being generous in the UK, there are three hundred thousand Jews uh, in total, and it's estimated that less than ten percent of those are Sephardi, like Spanish and Portuguese, or Sephardi Mizrahi from the Middle East. Um, and that includes the descendants of anyone who, who came from those areas. Um, on their arrival to the UK, as Bea said, many Jews uh, came and joined the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue. 
and the individual synagogue that they chose in largest numbers to join was Lauderdale Road. This influx of members revived the Spanish and Portuguese community within the UK. And today a parallel Baghdadi service is held alongside the Spanish Portuguese service on Yom Kippur at Lauderdale Road. And like, again, like Bea said, they didn't all join um, the Spanish and Portuguese. Some joined local Ashkenazi synagogues and faced this steep cultural and linguistic learning curve. And others chose to form new synagogues. And there are more than 30 independent synagogues in London alone each practicing Judaism in accordance to the customs and traditions of the various Sephardi Mizrahi communities um, to whom they belong. Young Jews whose parents or grandparents were born in the Middle East, North Africa and Iran have been the impetus behind the recent pushes to include Sephardi Mizrahi Judaism, culture and history into all aspects of Anglo Jewry. And this can be seen through the recent widening of the scope of adult educational programming within the community here. Um, through organizations such as the Jewish Music Institute, JW3, and Limud Festival, programming has kind of grown to include Sephardi Mizrahi culture in a bigger way than just in a tokenistic, you know, cookery course. And in addition to this, over lockdown from 2020 on, Harif have hosted well-attended weekly online lectures um, that have reached a global audience. And of course, we're, we at Sephardi Voices are also playing our part. Um, we had an exhibition at the Jewish Museum in 2017, and we have a regular article um, with the Jewish Renaissance um, magazine showcasing our interviews. Philanthropists such as the Sassoons and the Dangors have also played a role in re revitalizing the anglo sephardi Jewish community. Uh, and it was with the support of the Dangor family, the Exilart Foundation, that the first Sephardi primary school in London, uh, in England, sorry, was, was established. So far, I've been talking about Savadi Mizrahi community and the impact of that within the Anglo-Jewish community. But Middle Eastern, North African and Iranian Jews who moved to the UK have made a large impact on British society as a whole. Amongst our interviewees are two members of the House of Lords and three who have received honours. And many, many others have made outstanding contributions to their fields. And I'm going to just mention just a few. Raymond Levy was born in Egypt. He was a psychiatrist who first outlined behavioral treatment for obsessive compulsive disorder. Brian Elias, born in India, was a is a renowned uh, modern, modernist composer who had his work performed at the Royal Albert Hall. Alan Levy, born in Egypt, worked as a chemist developing the formula for well-known brands such as Vicks and Oil of Ule. Silver, Sylvia Kaduri, born in Iraq, was a renowned scholar of Middle Eastern history. David Sofa, born in India, was a doctor who pioneered fertility treatment. Diane Dixon, born in Egypt, was a fashion designer who de defined the aesthetic of the clothing company Diesel. And Julian Sofa, born in Iraq, was a celebrated civic architect whose numerous buildings changed the physical landscape of several British cities. Um, I could go on and on and on, but I'm, we're conscious of time, so I'm not going to, but this is just to kind of give you a small idea of the things that our interviewees have done. Despite all these successes, there is still an underrepresentation of Sephardi Mizrahi Jewish stories, history and culture within the Ashkenazi majority British Jewish community. Jews from the Middle East first arrived in significant numbers to the UK over 70 years ago, and yet their stories are still not mainstream within Anglo Jewry and British Jewish society. In 2021, the Board of Deputies of British Jews published the report of its commission on racial inclusivity in the Jewish community. The aim of the commission was, quote, to learn more about the experiences of black Jews, Jews of color and Sephardi, Mizrahi and Yemenite Jews, end quote. Their recommendations included, amongst other things, that teaching in Jewish schools include the experiences of Sephardi, Mizrahi Jewry and that Jewish communal institutions such as synagogues and um, schools should commemorate key dates in non-Ashkenazi Jewish history. That these recommendations had to at all be made in 2021 is an insight into how much further there is to go. And Sephardi Voices like here at UK, what we're doing and the work that we are doing to share our pre precious archive is at the forefront of this push for broader Jewish education within the Anglo-Jewish community. I hope that um, I've given you a small flavor um, that despite being very, very relatively small in number, 
Middle Eastern, North African and Iranian Jews have made a very large impact on British and Jewish society. Um, but I'm now going to pass back over to Bea and she's going to talk to you a little bit about how this migration impacted their own identities. Um, thank you, Daisy. Um, it's it's I really enjoy watching the films and you know we've done all these interviews, but always nice to to see people back on screen and just to say um, maybe you don't know Ellis Dweck is actually the brother of Claudia Roden, uh, who is a very eminent food writer, and many of you will know her. She changed really the um, the landscape of of, uh, of cooking, um, and uh, also to say Margaret Hodge, of course, has been very very important in the fight against labor anti-Semitism, so a very important figure as well. So I just wanted to come back to what I said before um, about the aims of oral history earlier. So on the one hand, uh, we're looking for historical reconstruction of lived experiences. On the other, we're looking for subjective interpretation of a narrated life. And some parts of the interview focus more on one aspect, some more on the other. And we make sure um, there is enough time for discussing broader, the broader issue of identity, uh, which is important in most interviewees or general reflections. So I just wanna say a little bit about identity and then show you uh, another short film. So here you can see on the left, you can see uh, an example from an artist uh, called Lisette Stelbo, who we interviewed. Uh, she'd come from Egypt. And she says about this installation, she says, quote, I realized that often the things that we had forgotten or not forgotten had such an impact on us because we think we're fine but they came through in whatever creative work you do. And she says, all my work is around uh, identity. So identity is a really important topic in, in all the interviews. And what is fascinating about the topic of identity, of course, that it lies in between the state of, it's an in-between topic because it's in between historical experiences and individual choices. So identities are shaped, of course, by the cultural and historical parameters of the home and the reception country. And they're also shaped by the individual's experiences and personal choices. Hence the experiences and understanding of identity among Sephardi Mizrahi Jews who emigrated to Israel, to France, Canada, or USA would be quite different uh, to the interviewees in the UK. And I think this would make a really interesting study. I hope somebody will, um, you know, will compare, uh, you know, how, how people, how the Sephardi Mizrahi Jews um, define themselves differently depending on which country uh, they emigrated to. So looking at the narratives of identities among the people we interviewed, um, it reveals the complexity of the historical experiences and also reveals the lack of general and commonly known narratives about the Sephardi Mizrahi experiences, um, what Daisy just said before, and that's not only in the UK, but also um, worldwide. And there, this refers to both the, the silences, of course, in the country of birth, for example, in Iraq and Egypt, many people don't know that Jews lived in these countries, but also in the country of um, current residents, which is slightly changing now. One interviewer told me that when asked about where he was from, he realized very soon that it was much easier to say that he was from France than saying that he was from Egypt, as then he had to explain why he spoke French and why he had to leave Egypt in the 50s. A Tunisian interviewer said to me, I'm a bit French, a bit Arab, and very Jewish. Another woman described herself Iraqi with the Mediterranean flair. Another said, I'm Jewish, Egyptian born, French speaking, British subject. Another said, um, no, French Jewish, British subject. So you can see how complex these identities are. Um, in many ways, these identities challenge common understanding of national and cultural identities. As the eminent composer Brian Elias, who Daisy mentioned before, who grew up in India and whose parents were Iraqi says, quote, I'm a phenomenon of the 20th century, raised within the parameter, parameters of globalization and cross-cultural experiences. So comparing the narratives of identities in the Sephardi Voices UK archive, I'd like to point out three areas of convergence. First, the importance of being Jewish, which for many interviewees means belonging to a Jewish community, but for others not necessarily belonging, for example, to a synagogue. While moving between countries and um, and often, as Daisy said before, interviewees moved to more than one country. Being Jewish was something that stayed uh, with the interviewees and gave a sense of continuity. There are also a few interviewees who converted to Christianity in the archive, not many, 
or others for whom political identities, for example, belonging to the Communist Party or being communist, were more important than being Jewish. The second area of convergence is feeling British English or also not belonging. Uh, many interviews feel that they've been in Britain for a long time and that the UK is their home. But some uh, feel that having had to leave the, their country of birth, their overarching feeling of identity is not belonging. In a moving interview with Nicolas Mawas, uh, next slide please, who was born in Alexandria, then left for Italy and then moved to the US and then came uh, to live in Sussex in the UK, uh, in her interview she told me, and you can see the quote on the top here, I carried on being a refugee in a different condition, but I carried on and it marked me. It made me feel unsafe. Coming here and in a way not being accepted because they cannot understand my makeup. This is complicated. We went to a restaurant the day before yesterday. The main waiter came and she said, what's your background? Because of my accent, they realize I don't belong here. So I don't belong anywhere. That's the worst kind of refugee. Do you see? In the interview, she describes her migration, and this is some, an image which really stayed with me, as having changed from being a forest of trees to being one tree. And I think this is a very powerful image which describes the situation of many of our interviewees, their large families and their communities were dispersed in the emigration process. When I asked Nicolette, Nicolette what she missed most from Egypt, and I put the quote here because I think, again, this applies to many other people, she says, what is the most important part? Um, she said, is the feeling that you belonged, not necessarily in the synagogue, but in that community. There was always an aunt or somebody around. You felt love, you felt friendship. You felt you had always somebody to go to and that I don't have. I haven't had it since I was 23 and I miss it. And again, I think it's a very powerful quote. Um, next slide, please. The third area of convergence is feeling rejected or expelled or made refugees by the country of birth. Um, and again, this is very, very important in the interview, this, this experience of rejection, expulsion, persecution from the country of birth of the interviewees. As you will hear in this short film, many interviewees see themselves as Iraqi or Egyptian despite having been forced to leave. Linda Dengor, who we mentioned before, the London-based ceramicist and food writer, describes his experience as being orphaned, as having lost a motherland. While her father, Abdallah Dengor, who you can see um, in, the, in a short while, proudly states that he's Iraqi and that he has been there for 3,000 years. Many factors influence the interviewee's relationship to the country of birth. The age of the interview and the date of emigration are two important ones and uh, hopefully somebody will look at the interviews in more detail and analyze how, how those factors shape um, you know, the, the identity and the integration process. The, um, an interviewee who left Iraq in the 50s had a very different experience to an interviewee who left Iraq in the 1970s, and it witnessed, for example, the public hanging of Jews in 1969. In the short film we prepared for you, you can hear 11 of our interviews discuss how this, they describe their own identities. And here's a picture of the 11 interviewees. Among them, the interviewees were born in Baghdad, and you can see on top Abdallah Dangor um, and Linda Dangor in the middle with the glasses, uh, Jacqueline Khalashi and Niran Basun Timan, uh, who's in the middle with the red top. Uh, she's a social activist, very involved in social media and Arabic. Um, you can see here Brian Elias on the right, here where the arrow is, um, the composer. Uh, Cairo, we have Vivian Harris, uh, people born in Alexandra, Su Susie Dweck, who you already saw in the previous film. Um, uh, you've seen Justin Schrager, born in, in Algiers, and you have Naomi Pope, born in Rangoon. Um, and who, her fe testimony featured in an event last week as she was a British Habonim volunteer on the Exodus, uh, and whose task was to help the, with the Aliabet the clandestine immigration of Jews to British Mandate Palestine, and we were lucky to interview, um, and she told us about her experiences on the Exodus. So now let's watch the, the short film. I 
I am English Sephardi. I am I am English, um, because uh, yes, I've been English. I've been living here um, for thirty years, which is the most time I spent in the country. You see more than Morocco and um, and and Spain. Um, and Sephardi because of my uh, culture. Yes, of my culture and my traditions. I don't know to tell you the truth. I don't know. The constant is Jewish. People in England call me French. The people in France call me English. What I am, I have no idea. It's a mixture of French, Jewish, Sephardi, Ashkenazi, you know, and the whole lot. The whole lot. But how can I deny that I'm an Iraqi? I didn't go there as an immigrant. I've been there for 3,000 years. Well, here I feel I'm English now. It's a long time, 1956 to now. When I first came here, they called me Egyptian. They said, you're Egyptian. I said, yes, but I'm not wanted there. They don't want me. I'm not Egyptian. I will happen to be born there. But I'm not Egyptian. Well, I have that background. I can't eliminate it. Even that the country has changed totally. Absolutely, you know. But uh, I'm still what I am. That's what I am. I'm a Sephardi Jewess <laughs> from Egypt. <laughs> when you lose your parents, you become bereft, you know, you become an orphan. And on a much more sociological level, a country is, is also, they call it the motherland, so it's also like a parent. And if the politics of that country rejects you, then you are also an orphan. So many times I used to find this parallel, uh, I used to feel this parallel. I used to feel that I was uh, an orphan. I was being orphaned because I don't have a country. I feel Jewish Iranian. That is, that is my uh, true feeling I have. I was telling my friends when we arrived, you can really, really, you feel you are being British when you uh, dream in English. And it, it really happened to me first time. I said, oh, I was dreaming in English. And this was the sign of adaptation. I see myself as a bit of an odd ball some actually because I'm not European and I'm not Asian and uh, I'm certainly Jewish. I suppose Jewish is the defining of who I am because that's stable. I'm just me, I mean I'm, uh, I'm a composer. Yeah. Uh, that's what that's what identifies me, uh, you know. And I'm, yes, I'm. I'm uh, very much a phenomenon of the twentieth century. Partly, what I am because of this cross-cultural, the globalization, and things like that. I am a British by naturalization. So are my all my children. Of course, we are Iraqis still, uh, but we don't. Uh, like to consider we are Iraq Iraqis anymore because it's it's really hard we had hard time so we consider ourselves up as British mm. I always present myself as an Iraqi Jew always they're both as important as each other you know I can't be a Jew without being Iraqi and I can't be Iraqi without being a Jew 
It goes together. I was born there. You know, it's written in my passport. I can't change it. It's just like I, I can't change anything in me. I can't change my personality. That's me. I can't change my history. I cannot be a different person than being Niran, the daughter of Salim and Miriam. I cannot. So this is part of me. I hope that based on stories of our and other archives, much more research can be done to illuminate what Sarah Funio Cohen calls the silent displacement of the Sephardi Mizrahi Jews. Following the report, which Daisy already mentioned, of the special commission by the Jewish Board of Deputies, we know that much more needs to be done to represent the diverse Jewish experiences on all levels to fight the bias of don't know whether you're familiar with this word, the Ashkenormativity in the British Jewish community. Well, there seems to have been some reluctance by the first generation of Sephardi Mizrahi Jews to talk about their histories publicly. And I should say, um, somebody asked in the chat why we didn't mention the Syrian Jewish community. We have actually just recently done two interviews, Syrian Jewish interviews, but we haven't managed to find people who wanted to be interviewed. And there are quite a few people who really don't want to be interviewed for this kind of archive. And the reasons are complex. There is also maybe an element of fear. There's, um, you know, some people are worried about this being shown publicly, about misuse, and they're all legitimate concerns. Um, so it wasn't so easy for us to find necessarily people who want to, to speak. And we're proud that we've managed to find 120 people. Um, so while there was a reluctance, I would say, in the first generation, um, there is now, and Daisy mentioned it, a growing number of second and third generations who feel that they need to bring the history of their parents and grandparents into the public realm. And among them, Lynn Julius, who co-founded Kharif and who is the author of Uprooted, uh, and also another woman called Carol Isaacs, who some of you might know, she just wrote a, she wrote a graphic novel called The Wolf of Baghdad, which is now being adapted into a book for young readers. Um, and also my co-speaker tonight, Daisy Aboudi, who was mentioned she's not only deputy director of Safari Voices, but also the creator of Tales of Sudan, a website dedicated to the history of Jews of Sudan. So while Safari Voices UK is committed at the moment to interviewing the first generation, in the future, we might be interested to add the voices of the children and grandchildren to our collection. Thank you so much. And if you have any questions, uh, I'd like to support our work, please get in touch with us. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Bia. Um, thank you, Daisy. That was very insightful. Um, I can see that um, you answered the question about the about why there were um, until recently no uh, Syrian stories in your archive. Do you want to say a bit more about what, how you um, how you found? those that you did interview and 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 also more generally about how you choose who to interview and how you research the, the people um, that you want to reach um, you want to about the syrian yeah. interviewees because so first of all it also goes back to demographics that there are such a small number of of Sy people who came from syria who now live in london most of them are in america or, or israel so to start with your on a very, very, very small pool. Um, I interviewed actually just on Monday, a couple and um, a husband and wife. They came to us through their son, who is a Diane here in London. Um, and I mean, it was so recently, it's not actually um, that. Oh, so why was there no mention in the table? Because the table was from May and I just interviewed them on Monday. We haven't even updated our, mm. um, <laughs> our, 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 our things yet. So. Um, yeah, it's it's really, really recently, like not even a whole week ago that I interviewed them. Um, so, yeah, and they were saying there are no Syrians here. They, um, you know, we're, we're in, I don't have any Syrian friends. I'm completely cut off from the Syrian community. So that there, there just aren't the people here to actually interview. And we're, we're really I mean, we've been trying to 
persuade them to be interviewed for like nearly two years. So we were really, really grateful that they that they even agreed to be interviewed. If you know of anyone, obviously any any serious, yes, please. Please, please send them our way. We would <laughs> love to interview do. anyone. Um, shall I send, say something about how we find more in general? Yeah. So uh, in general, we never, you know, put ads out. It was word of mouth. Uh, we tried to contact communities through Lauderdale, through everything. But um, the, as I said, there, ha there has been, there is a reluctance. We're not selecting people. Anyone who would like to be interviewed can be interviewed. Um, and we find that mostly the Iraqi and Egyptian community, they, they are most, more, most willing uh, to be interviewed. I think it, it's also linked to the notion of testimony and whether people find this is an important aspect. Um, and as I said, there is a reluctance I, we have found to, to give testimony. Or somebody, we, we are referred to somebody or a child or said, yeah, why don't you interview my parent, grandparent? We phoned them and they said, no, sorry, we, we, we don't want to be interviewed. And we won't force people, you know. No. Like I said, we've been wanting to interview them for two years because their son has been coming to us for two years and so many people have said, interview this couple. But, you know, I spoke I spoke to them a year ago and they said, absolutely not. So until they come to us and say, we're ready now, we're not going to, you know, that's not what we do. I noticed that you had um, one person from Iran on that last film, but generally, um, just um, myself growing up in, in Northwest London, I was aware of people from the Persian and Iranian community, but you seem to have very few interviews from there. Is, is that also part of the same reluctance? It's for the same reason. I mean, you know, there is a, Kinlos has a big uh, the, a Persian community, you know, Kinlos Synagogue. Uh, we have spoken there. We have tried to find people. I think we have four, a, a small number. And I also said, should say, we interviewed one person from Iran uh, who was happy to be interviewed. Um, then after the interview, he spoke to his wife and he withdrew the interview. I think it's a bit different with Iran as well because some of them have family still that living there. Yes. So it's a bit more, it's not so much in the past for them. It's it's a more difficult politically thing to, to, to then have that in the British Library for the end of time um it's, it's quite yes. a big thing for them to, to do yes people right. are yeah. and, and do you find i'm just asking please uh and in, in the audience you're more than invited to to put your questions in the chat um are you finding in terms of the interviews that you do have and that you have analyzed via um a difference between those you were talking about those who had an experience earlier or later in the, the country of origin, but the experience of their arrival in the UK and their acceptance. Do you notice that that's changed between the 40s, the 50s, 60s and later? Well, I think, um, you know, a lot of, many of our interviewees who came to the UK have had family connections, uh, especially the Iraqis, I would say. Daisy, would you say in the, who came in the 50s, they joined other family members? Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's a different, and, and of course, depends on the country. A lot of the, the Egyptian interviews, you know, came to refugee, they were actively helped, they were considered refugees, and they stayed in refugee hostels. So that's quite different from the Iraqi emigration. Um, and of course, the Iranian came much later, you know, post-76. So, you know, British society changed, and Alice Dweck said it, British society became more cosmopolitan. So I would imagine it was, it's, easier um you know to emigrate later having said that it depends very much which community you're finding when you come and not everyone was looking for community some people did some people didn't um and i'm very aware that there are people who we don't find because they're not part of the jewish community there are people like that as well you know so that's always the problem uh how representative is, is our sample of 120 interviews and I think the age of the people when they were here, when when they arrived, also makes a big difference in their experience. Yeah. So you know, if you if you come as a child, your memories are much more pleasant because you know it's your childhood, <laughs> and you were kind of sheltered from the horrible things that were happening. Whereas people who came as adults and were maybe more aware of what was going on around them, that colors their opinion as well of, of how they look back. Yeah. I mean, maybe one interesting phenomenon is that um, of children, 
were sent to British boarding schools. They were the parents sent the children out before they emigrated themselves um, from Sudan and from Egypt. For example, Elias Dweck was sent to be educated in England uh, before, before the parents came. So that's quite interesting. Um, but of course, it helped them because they, as children, they could finish their schooling in England. Yes, that, that is interesting. We've come to the end of the hour. So thank you very, very much for this very um, different kind of um, window into Anglo Jewry. And um, there's lots more that I'm sure we could talk about in terms of how you would compare that with testimonies which have been so um, more comprehensively collected from Austrian and German refugees. And, and maybe this is a, has actually, um, this is actually sort of encouraged Mosafadin to, uh, and Mizrahin to, to actually be interviewed by you. Um, and you've got a suggestion here um, from Yitzhak Kerem, and, and the address will save the chat for you because that looks like uh, somebody who could actually open more opportunities for more interviewees. Um, but thank you very much, Professor Yitzhak Kerem, for that comment. And I think we will close this evening. Thank you everybody very much and for joining us. But thank you very much, Bia. Thank you very much, Daisy. And good luck with all of your work. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye.